Well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Frederick Winsness with the with NetHope and the NetHope Solution Center. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we will be. Um, um, is that the recording going? Yeah. Um, uh, we're super excited about having everyone here for the um, uh, webinar on harnessing the power of robotics for social good. Uh, we're um, joined by Panama Flying Labs, and we'll, I'm going to turn it over to Duncan Drury for a, uh, a brief introduction in a second. Before we get started, I want to go over some housekeeping rules. Um, as usual, uh, we are recording this session, and you will find the recording and the presentation materials posted to the NetUp Solutions Center after the session. And feel free to share that with colleagues and others that may be interested in uh, uh, the topic. Uh, we're also interested in making this as interactive as possible. So please open the chat window uh, in WebEx. You can do that by clicking the, the third icon from the right on the bottom of your screen. And um, uh, please. Uh, uh, post your questions there, and we will be facilitating a question and answer session towards the end of the hour today. And uh, asking a huge favor at, at the very end of the webinar, when you leave, uh, you will see a online survey or webinar satisfaction poll, and we certainly would appreciate you answering those few questions to improve this webinar series uh, over time. So um, let me. Um, Quickly introduce Duncan Drury. He is uh, the ICT consultant uh, uh, with the NetHope and Connectivity and Infrastructure Working Group, and uh, he will be introducing Dania uh, with Panama Flying Labs. So, Duncan, over to you. Thanks very much, Frederick. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this uh, latest in the series of uh, Connectivity and Infrastructure Working Group webinars. Um, brought to you by NetHope. Um, I'm really excited um, about the subject matter that we're talking about today. So one of the cutting edge technologies introduced into the work of NetHope members in recent years is drones. Uh, they are autonomous mobile robots that you program to carry out some sort of activity, um, generally involving traveling somewhere, but they also use artificial intelligence to make decisions during their journey to uh, correct their course and overcome various obstacles. Um, these have been used by NetHope members in, in a variety of different applications, including search and rescue, uh, and the assessment of land and, and, and refugee communities. And I expect this to grow and develop in the coming years. It's an area that I think lots of NetHope members uh, have already started to, to, to show interest in. Uh, and yeah, I, I expect we'll, we'll see a lot, a lot more. Um, a lot more from it. Um, so yeah, so today we have uh, Dania Montenegro Chong. Uh, she's an engineer in nautical sciences um, with specialization in navigation and maritime transport uh, based in Panama. Uh, she's, she's got more than 12 years experience in maritime and logistics, um, which I think has quite a lot of intersection with uh, the kind of work that NetHope members do. Um, and now she's taking her passion for community service and humanitarian aid and the environment um, in, into, into the area of drones. Um, so she's uh, the project coordinator of Panama Flying Labs, um, which she's now going to talk to us about. So over, over to you, Dania. Thanks a lot. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Frederick. Thanks, Duncan, and NetHope for that kind invitation. Um, sorry for my English, as my native language is the Spanish. My apologize in advance for any mistake uh, in my pronunciation of the use of the correct word. Thanks for all of you for taking time to understand a little more about the drones, because drones are robots, and what are used for, and why Flying Labs and other organizations believe that in harnessing the power of robotics for social good. The next uh, 54 minutes, I will share with you some main details so you can explore more info about the drones. And my main goal is to help you to figure out if robotics 
can be the solution in the near future for your organizations. So let's start. First of all, Panama Flying Labs, just you, so you can understand better a little bit. Uh, we are a lab located or created by the following donors. Uh, our main donor is the Inter-American Development Bank, the BIT Lab. We are hosted in the University of Technological University of Panama, and our technical advisor uh, is a group of We Robotics. We are part of We Robotics, and you will understand uh, in the next with, with this presentation how it works. Let's start and talk about the main topics we will review today. First, we need to understand what is a civil drone and for what is used for it. We will talk a little bit about drone mapping and photogrammetry, some of the barrier challenges and issues we can face, some examples of applied robotics across humanitarian and development contexts, and finally, how can the humanitarian sector influence the development and use of the drone? First of all, to understand, we need to know what is a drone. For the International Civil Aviation Organization, that is the head of all the, 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 the civil aviation authorities, a drone is an aircraft, all machine that can sustain an atmosphere due to air reactions, all of, all, or all of them not considering the impact to the surface of the earth. This is the meaning or the description of what is a drone for the civil aviation organization, that is an aircraft. For example, in Panama, for the Autoridad de Aeronáutica Civil, our head authority regarding to airspace, is an aircraft also, is an aircraft that has no pilot on command on board. And for the US Department of Defense, a drone is a land, sea, or air vehicle that is remotely or automatically controlled. Most of the countries have categories for their drones. Uh, for what? To understand in which category is and if any rules applies or not, if there is a regulation or not for the drones. For example, in Panama, we have the resolution 120 that divides the drones per weight. Uh, in other countries, for example, they, can they have classification for the UAS, on man aerial system, that is the same as a drone. Some of the defense agencies have their own standard to classify them by type, by weight. There's a lot of classifications that can apply. For example, in the United States, they use one classification according to the size. If there is very small, micro, nano, small, mini, medium, large, they can also classify according to the range they have and also the endurance. In this slide, for example, you will see all of them are drones. The four of them are drones with different uses in this case, for example, um, the first one that is a Honeywell, that is the, the one that has like a blue sky. You can see that it's completely different for the main that is at the, on, in all the, the, the center of the slide. This one that has this green, uh, this green, this is a life, is a life, life, raft, life raft, not, is a life buoy. This, this drone is used in Australia, actually. And it was, it, this, this drone has a very interesting history because it was like two years ago, they were using the drone, they were, tra they were making some tests on the drone. This drone is, it has a, like a warning alarm and it also can carry out this object that you, that you can see there, this green object, that when it touched the water, 
it 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 it's inflated and it can help the people, the swimmers, because in that place of Australia, that is Wales, they face problems. They have very heavy, um, heavy sea conditions, and uh, they were testing this equipment. And when they were using to monitor that beach at that area, they found two young persons that were facing problems at that moment. And the equipment threw down this appliance and it got inflated and it saved the people. So in Australia, for example, is a country where the drones are being used for humanitarians, for surveillance, for monitoring, are, and it's very advanced, that type of, the, the different uh, sectors they are using the drones. But let's return to, the, to what is a civil drone. As we already explained, it's an aircraft that has no pilots on command on board. We can have different type of drones. At these slides, you will see we have six drones. And the six drones are from different types. The multi-rotors are the two first ones that you can observe at the left side of the slides. At the middle, you will have the fixed wings. And at the end, you will have, you will have uh, the hybrid, the hybrid drones. Everything is moving to this last type of drones. Why? It's very simple. Here you have the two first type of drone. The fixed wing that is at the right hand. With this type of drones, you need a certain amount of space so you can make the maneuver of launching and also when that drone is returning home. With the Phantom that we have at the left hand, you don't need too much space for the maneuver of taking off, okay? This one, the one from the left side, needs a, has a vertical takeoff maneuver. The one from the right side needs space for the maneuver, which is the advantage of the hybrid. The hybrid one can have a vertical takeoff I return to the previous slide, has a vertical takeoff and it has the endurance of the fixed wings because the fixed wings can plane in the air and will not demand too much battery. What happens with the multi-rotor, for example? So that technology, the drones, the technology in, in, the, in the drones industry is going toward this last type of equipment, the hybrid equipment because it will give more advantage. Continuing with our main topic, what the civil drones are used for? We can see that drones can be used to take videos and films. This is the first use when they start uh, in the civil area, because the drones start in the military area since uh, 1909, we have drones, but just for the military employment. Right now, we can have the drones, the civil people can use drones, and when the drones start in the market, the first use was in video and films. We can also use drones for monitoring and surveillance. Industrial operations face constant safety and security threats which requires real-time response. Solutions to provide a rapid, precise, and reliable situation awareness. Some companies have developed platforms that provide security officers and emergency responders with a professional tool for collecting unlimited aerial data and providing real-time uh, visibility. First, we use cameras, but now, with the drones, you know that the camera is put in a certain area and it has a certain angle to cover. But with the drone, you can monitor. You can move and, and make your, your, you can monitor the, the place on real time 
and you will have visibility and you can face emergency situations. Security operations are simplified with predefined missions. You can load to the drones, and what, that's why the drones are robots. You can load the mission, and you can load the mission so the equipment will follow a route to be monitoring the area you need to be constantly uh, collecting information from. The completely automatic platform autom autonomously deploys and lands the drone. That's an advantage. When you load the mission, the drone can deploy and land and will collect the aerial data to be processed and analyzed. You can be seeing on real time the information and by the end you can process and analyze the information. Real time aerial video and photos, and photos are delivered directly to the person that is at the ground, that is at the office, wherever he is. He can be making monitors and can have routine patrols. These platforms eliminate that the logistic, eliminates that the logistic involved in drought operations while provide reliable, scalable, and on-demand area data collection. Okay, this is one of the use of drones. Private companies can use to monitor their factories, their industry, and also the police can use, use drones as patrols also. Another use of civil drones is drones for search and rescue. Okay, at the left side, the left, the photo that you see in the left is a rescue that was done at Peru. Peru and part of our team was also there, uh, not our team of Panama, because Flying Lab is a regional network all over the world, and in Peru we have a representation. For example, in Peru, the drones are used a lot uh, for search and rescue. Uh, they have some areas at Peru where the flooding is constant, in some seasons of the year, and what they did at Flying Labs Peru is they put all the equipment they had at the entire disposal of the emergency groups, patrols, at the deployment just to make a mapping of the area that was overflowed to see if they were people that people needing any type of assistance in this case. Uh, medical assistance, to send all the boats uh, to move uh, aerial assistance, but the first, they make the mapping also to identify the right way to reach to the people that were above the roof, that were facing problems toward this uh, flood situation. On the right side, you have the drone we already talked about in Australia, that is used actually, actually in Australia, they are using this equipment to monitor the beach and the bay at Wales, where the conditions, the meteorological, meteorological conditions of the sea, the very, the very high wave, uh, most of the time uh, causes uh, danger, uh, dangerous situations to the swimmers and to the people, the, the, the tourists that went, to take uh, to go to the beach, for example, and also some of the drones at that uh, at that area at Wales also are used to identify sharks. Also, they have algorithms algorith algorithms already developed to identify sharks and make a warning when the sharks are uh, are near the people that that is uh, at the beach. Okay, we continue in the next use of other use of the civil drones. We use also the drones for vertical infrastructure surveys. Um, in this type, in this case, particular case, we are talking about drones. Most of the time you use multi-rotor drones. The, this type, if you see both images, they are multi-rotors drones. 
because they have a better performance in a vertical going up and down is easier than using a wing. A fixed wing is not a proper equipment to be used for a vertical infrastructure survey, for example. Most engineers and architects will use these type of equipment to make inspections and surveys to the infrastructures of buildings and also horizontal constructions of roads, uh, bridge, any type of construction. Now they use the drones for these type of surveys. We also have the case of drones for cargo, cargo drones. Drones for the airline industry. Um, until this moment, for example, in Panama is not allowed to use the drones for cargo. It's prohibited. You cannot throw anything for a drone here in Panama, for example. But there are other places, for example, Singapore, I understand also the United States, that they are making prototypes, working on prototypes for uh, drones destined for cargo. While much of the focus of the drones to date has been on military applications, because as, as I start from the beginning, the, the first drones were for military application, or they start also as toys. Um, the future of the drones right now is to support the airline industry. That, that, that's a completely uh, actual situation here, it's promising. They have opportunity because they will give efficiency, reduce cost, and increase speed. Uh, right now, in cargo drones or in the airline industry, we have identified three main uses for the drones. Airport and ground operations to make ground safety checks, to make checklists. We can use the drones for aircraft, runway, and maintenance for airport, perimeter monitoring, wildlife control, warehouse operations, for transport of goods, in this particular case, transport of parcels, general and special cargo in urban space, as well as rural and remote locations also. And transport of passengers. In Singapore, they are working on prototypes uh, for drones to transport passengers. Uh, like two weeks ago, one month ago, there was a prototype working and, and they already test the equipment. The pilot, the, the engineer working on this prototype, he was on board and made the first test on this equipment. That is a very big equipment that has the capacity to carry out one passenger on board. So the 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 identification of the drones as an alternative alternative for carrying out cargo is now and is here and the people is working on it and drones for social good uh, that's why flying lab exists we think that drones can be used for social good in this um, slide, you will find uh, the first corner in the left. This is the team of flying labs in Tanzania. They are using a fixed wing, and they are making community engagement because this is the first point or the, the initial point for any employment, uh, uh, any use of drones for social good you need community engagement. You need to, to explain to people why we are using drones, if it's safe or not for them, which will be the advantage of using the drone, to explain it that it will make no harm, uh, to, under, to make them understand that it has to be used in a legal and responsible way. On the right hand, this is the team of We Robotics from Peru, the, the man with the red shirt. This is the We Robotics, uh, the flying labs at Peru. They use this fixed wing for the transportation of blood and vaccines and antivenom to a very, very uh, far away community 
that by water you will take uh, about six hours to reach from, the, from this point to that faraway community. And with the drones, it was about 45 minutes. So it's, it was a real good experience. And first of all, we make that community engagement. And the last picture is my team in Panama. We were giving a training uh, the use and employment of the drones. We were making our first workshop there, explaining we have there, that is a Quantum 4 from the DGI company. And this is my pilot, that is Lionel. He's a pilot, and he, we were explaining uh, the, how we use the, the equipment, the main parts, and how to make the maneuvers with them. Okay, let's talk about drones for mapping. That is one of the main uses of the drones. The first known aerial photograph was taken in uh, 1858, okay? This was the first time we have a, an aerial photo here. And it was taken by the French photographer and balloonist named Gaspar Felix Tournachon, known as Nadar. The English meteorologist um, Archibald was among the first to take a successful picture from a kite in 1882. Uh, pigeons were mounted with cameras, as you may see there, in the World War I to take photographs from the enemy troops and fortification. And the first aerial photography taken from an airplane was in 1909 by Wilbur Wright. Okay, so what is photogrammetry? This is our first question. What is photogrammetry? Photogrammetry is the science of making measurements from photographs. The output from photogrammetry are typically maps, drawings, or 3D models of some real world object or landmass. That is what is photogrammetry mainly. And the photogrammetry is obtained from the drone mapping. Drones mapping from 2D to 3D model. Drone mapping, that is the aerial photogrammetry, is the science of defining the spatial position and 3D dimension of an object or surface point from photograph, from photographs that are duty. To create 3D maps from aerial photogrammetry, the camera is mounted on the drone and is usually pointed vertically towards the ground. Using photogrammetry to create 3D models of monuments or statues, the camera is mounted, mounted horizontally over the aircraft. Two very important concepts to take in account at the moment you are going to make drone mapping is before making the, the mission, before loading the mission, is to consider that you have to apply or to take in account the overlapping, the overlapping that will be horizontal and longitudinal, programming uh, your, your mission here. Influence parameters. To make a 3D or, or 2D models, that is the info can you take, that you can take from, uh, from a drone mapping, you can obtain surface models, here specially corrected aerial images, you can have 3D building models, you can take counter maps, you can take planimetric features, road edge, heights, building footprints, and you can make volumetric surveys. But before obtaining these type of products, you have to take in account, in account before making the mission plan, three important three important um, parameters. The first one is the image acquisition plan type. The image acquisition plan type depends on the type of terrain or objects to be reconstructed. 
you, when you have the mission, you can select if you will do in a single grid, in a double grid, if you are going to make a polygon. You decide the type of mission you want to load to the drone. But it depends mainly of the type of terrain you will be flying over. This is the main and important and the first parameter to take in account before planning your mission. The second is the ground sampling distance. The ground sample distance can affect the accuracy of your survey. It's a distance between the center point of each sample taken on the ground. And then you can see like a mesh at the down in the middle. You can see the mesh. This is important to know the distance, the ground sampling distance you need to have in order to obtain a good survey. And the next parameter you have to consider, first of all, is the overlap of the photograph. That when you load the mission, you decide the height, the distance, the area. You need to decide also the overlap of each picture one over one. You have to review the overlap and the side lab. It's recommended always to use between uh, 17 and 80 percent of overlap because at the end you will obtain certain products that depends on the accuracy of the pictures you took. Sometimes the camera can uh, You can, you can lose the take of a picture with the camera. And if you have a good overlap, the total amount of pictures that you get can help to obtain a good product at the end. So the overlap is a parameter you have to take in consideration and is very important if you want to obtain a good product by the end. This is talking a little bit about photogrammetry and drones mapping. If I have to make you a resume, first of all, you have to go to the place you want to fly over. You need to decide the height you will flew, you will flow with you will fly the height needed. Um, if you make a, a, a very high, for example three hundred meters, you will do the flight of the total area in a very short time. But but Surely, surely, surely the, 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 okay, first of all, sorry, sorry, uh, first of all, you have to take in consideration the total amount of place you are going to cover the height you are going to do it, and you have to consider the height. Before taking the decision of the height you are going to fly, you need to know the regulations you have regarding the type of equipment you are flowing, and you need to know also the quality of the image you need. This is the information to have, you have to consider, the parameters you need to consider before taking the decision of the height of flight you need to do. Let's move forward because we need to talk about why the drones are for social good. Okay, as I talked at the very beginning, I explained to you that We Robotics is our technical advisor. They start a program, We Robotics start a program where they open uh, flying labs, the flying lab network all over the world. Um, where they found uh, a colleague that wants to make an alliance. They opened this flying lab network to build capacity in the people to understand the employment of the drones and to help the community in the, in the needs they find out. For example, they have the programs of eco-robotics for nature conservation and agriculture. 
how they use the drones in nature conservation and agriculture, for example. They make high-resolution, here spatial data that can support research projects and find new ways of addressing nature conservation needs, climate change issues in agriculture. In this, in this picture that you have of eco-robotics, for example, this is an area where they found, this is an atolon in Seychelles, where they found some endemic species all over this atolon. They can identify, so they can make research projects. And the best of this information that you obtain for the drone, that is that he is geospatial data. It has reference, latitude and longitude, knowing where is exactly. This is a science of knowing where it is. This is important information that you can have in your hands in order to make a program of nature conservation, for example, and you can monitor pandemic species, for example. We robotics also have the development robotics. That is a program when you create the drones as a service. Here, this is an image from Tanzania when they made a design thinking program and when they give the solution to make incubations of entrepreneurs to find out the drone as a service and to give a service, for example. Here we have eight robotics. That is, the, this one, this service is very, very near, uh, for example, the employment, that the use of drones, for example, for NetHoop. When they make deployments, first of all, they need to understand the routes that are available to reach the area. Most of the time when you reach in the first, in the first meeting, you will find that the people coming, the people from the area will bring a map, will bring maps, but most of the time this map has no actual information, for example, and are not corrected and have no, and cannot, this is a map to guide you, but after the disaster, there will be a completely different area. So you can use this to have a high resolution aerial imagery after natural disasters to create your special data products and base layers for disaster. And you can make plans. For example, here in this image, they identify, they make the mission, they make the drone map, and they identify the houses that were fully destroyed are in red. The houses that were partially damaged are in yellow. And the areas with little to no damage with blue. This is a very important information because the equipment that are going in deployment can have, can make a plan, a route, a route plan, a route sheet to identify where are the areas fully destroyed and to give the first aid and to go with the humanitarian aid and they can they can make a plan they can make the project management here and they can handle the disaster this is a type of product that can be used for example in the particular case of net hope in this one this is one used um, over the seas for waste management this is a new way, find out, is a prototype. This is not a prototype because it's actually at the market. And you can use it to collect waste over, for example, the near areas near the port where a lot of uh, waste and pollution usually is collected. And this is an option of the use of robotics to provide uh, a solution against pollution. So you can ask the question, why, why, using, uh, why we consider that robotics can be a solution for handling uh, this type of, of disasters? This is a solution because you can collect a lot of data you can collect a lot of data 
even by air, by land, or by sea. And this data, data have a, a specific location. It, it gives you the latitude and longitude of information. With this type of information, you can make a plan for agriculture handling, for endemic species, to help and find people after a natural disaster. The robotics is a solution to gather information, to collect big data in a very quickly way and a rapid form. You can obtain information and then you can process and you can take products as orthomosaic that is a very big group of pictures that have a good overlap all over and are processed through softwares. And then you can identify the information you need for a certain work to do. Our group, We Robotics, has this small cake that says that the robotics is about the 10% and the we is the biggest amount because to make the drone flight, to make the mission, a mission with the drone can take you five minutes up to two hours, for example, depending on the total amount of area you want to cover. But the most important part of this, of this type of work is the we, is the people, is the community engagement, is to explain them why is it important to fly responsible? Why is it important to operate drones with a clear purpose? If it's humanitarian, environmental, if there is other, other benefit, should clearly outweigh the risk to person, wildlife, nature, or property. You have to respect the principle of humanity impartially and independent. You have to share the results of the flight widely as possible. It has to be publicly and engage with local communities before deploying. It's very important to engage with the community so they can understand your mission, they can feel identified with the purpose of your mission, and they will collaborate. It's very important. The experience of the people there before flying is very important to consider because they will give you advice of meteorological, for example, ghosts, of wind, they will give you advice if the rain is coming or not. They will give you a lot of advice. So it's very important to have a community engagement, first of all. This is the actual network of the flying labs all over the world. We have flying labs in Panama, in Tanzania, in Japan, in Benin, in the Peru, in Fiji. We have, we have more than 14 flying labs actually working. Survey results, drones applications of great interest uh, to humanitarian professionals. The mapping is the highest person. Coming the monitoring, as I explained to you previous, the search and rescue is gain terrain, the delivery, delivery of medicines. There are programs using drones to deliver medicines, also taking samples of blood, public information and other uses. Actually in Panama, we have three projects we, last week, we have an event, an international event here in Panama. There were more than 300,000 young coming to Panama. We make a collaboration, we make a, we sign a memorandum of collaboration for the photogrammetry process with the drones all over the designated area. Uh, so they can be prepared to host this big amount of young. With health, public health, we are making a monitoring and surveillance of urban village to identify the Ibis Egypti breathing ground. Uh, it, this project is in development and in alliance with the Ministry of Health. And we also have a pilot project in the climate change. Climate change. We identify the drones 
as a tool for monitoring the national sanitary landfill for waste disposal in Panama City in alliance with the Autoridad de Aseo Urbana Domiciliario. We fly all over this area that is about 200 hectares destined to deposit the waste of all Panama City. And they have to monitor the, the mountains of waste to avoid any type of accident and to decide when they have to close that area and open an other area to handle and manage the waste. Finally, I have here, this is the urban village, the urban village we flew over. First of all, we defined the area. This is the yellow line you see, we defined the area that we were going to monitor. We monitored this area in six minutes. And then we divide in parcel and we identify here you see all the roof. We identify with the, equip with the equipment, with the vertical survey, we identify the houses that can have problems with their roof, also with pools, and also in uh, the backyard. Well, they have a lot of stuff that can be an, an area for the Aedes aegypti development. And now, I think I have ended. I'm sure we have a lot of questions here that I have to process. Thanks for your attention. It was just like a very brief information of the drones. If you need more information, that certainly you will need more information because you need to first know the drones you have in the market to understand which is the best type of drone to make a certain work, and also you need to understand the software you need to use to process the information because gathering the information is that easy of the mission, the easy part of the, the mission. Processing the data is the one that takes too much time. It will take you, it can take you five hours, it can take you days to process all the images you have collected for a mission, you can collect about 900 images, for example. With the Hot IMJ project, we collect more than 900 images, and we took 48 hours to process the data. So I have to review all the questions you have so we can answer you. Um, that's sure. all. Tanya, this is Frederick. Uh, don't worry about uh, reviewing the questions. Um, uh, Duncan and I will take the, read the questions out to you, and you can address them. Okay, so, Duncan, do you want to go ahead and ask the first question? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much for, for that presentation, Daniel. That's, that, that's really in lots of um, areas of uh, support for us. Um, so some, some of the questions that came in while you were talking. Um, so for the various classifications of drones, are there different licensing schemes uh, for each of them? Um, yes. Uh, depending on the classification of the drones, there are different, li well, different license schemes, for example, in the United States. For example, in Panama, there is only one license that applies and depends on the size of the drone. Here in Panama, we have four classifications. And the first one that is the micro, you don't need a, a license. That is uh, this type of drone, weight less than 250 grams. So these equipments that are very small, for example, the Tejo from DGI, you mm -hmm. do not need a license. Here in Panama, for example, in the United States, the program for licensing is more complex and more complete and uh, I can tell you that in the next few years, all the countries will need a license. All the countries that are signature with OASI will need licenses because there is a program that is coming. There is an annex in the regulations that will start from the 2020, and you need you will need to have a license depending of that 
classification of the drone in your country. So the first thing you have to do is look at OASI or your civil aviation authority to see the regulation that applies for your country. Are there, are there any um, online resources that, that have compiled this for different countries? Uh, yes, but it's by country. Okay, so each country would have its own resource? Yes. Sorry? E e each country might have its own resource. I just wanted yes. somewhere each that country. Has, has, has summarized them by country. You, no, you can visit IATA, IATA and OASI. I can. I think I can text it. I'm not sure if I can text in the chat. No, we, we can add it into the FAQ later. Um, okay. So, okay. Um, a, a related question really is around around um, licensing when flying across national national boundaries. So sometimes um, organisations might be working or in a border area. Um, obviously, flying a drone over that border area might be sensitive. But what, what advice do you have for for NGOs doing this kind of thing? Okay, my advice for NGOs first. First, before taking a, a, a starting a maneuver, you have to visit the local the local authorities engaged on this on the drones. Most of the time is the civil authorization, uh, aeronautical civil authorization. Uh, you have to go because, first of all, before starting a mission, you have to take a permission. There is a format. It depends on the country. I can give you the examples of Panama. In Panama, you have a person in charge of giving you the authorization to fly a certain area. And it is very important. This is a, a very important advice because there are areas restricted or prohibited to be flying with a drone. For example, where the president of any country is, is prohibited to raise a drone. Uh, areas near airports, they are also prohibited to fly. There are a lot of accidents caused by drones, actually, in areas near the airport. And there is a regulation. You have to be out Eight in a radius of eight kilometers out from the airport to start, for example, in Panama. So you have to go and review the regulations locally before starting any mission with a drone. Okay, thanks. Daniel, the, the, there seems to be quite a few regulations and uh, um, you know controls over these over uh, that's that's evolving over time. Uh, do you do you recommend that NGOs and nonprofits invest in equipment and skills themselves, or should they bring in expertise from the outside? <clears throat> uh, it depends on the time of NGOs. Uh, for example, NetHoop that most of the time goes in deployments, for example, in the Caribs, areas with hurricanes. NetHope should have uh, an equipment, and uh, it, it will make their work easy. And, and, and with wind time, no? will avoid loose of time. But, you, the, for example, you can contact our flying labs in case you need uh, to build capacity. You can <clears throat> you can have the participation of our lab in the development of a project, and then you can decide if for your organization will be suitable or not to have your own equipment <clears throat> or just to invite people. Because flying a drone is a responsibility. I will say that a drone is a weapon. If it's not used with responsibility, it's a weapon, and it could cause harm. Even though it's a very friendly tool, <clears throat> sorry, has to be used by, ex by professionals. You can take the, you can build the capacity to use it, but it needs time and it needs practice. And depending on the type of mission you are going to develop, you have to decide if, if it's time to practice or if you need a professional on command of the drone. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, Duncan, do you want to do the next question? Sure. When, when data is collected by the drone, um, what are the possibilities around transmitting it in real time to, 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 to the operator on the ground versus uh, storing the video on board and, and collecting it later? Okay, you can, depending on the equipment that you have, you are able to, if you are making a, if you are, when you are flying, your camera will transmit the information in the equipment you are using to command the drone. So you are watching in real time. You can do it. And you have to connect, you have to have the suitable equipment to connect to a screen, for example. With what? Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, I was going to ask, so, so the, the quality of the images that are sent back in real time, would they, would they be typically good enough for, for, for further analysis or, or, or uh, are good, images stored? It's good, it's good, but remember that drone will fight against wind mm -hmm. in uh, certain external situations that can influence directly in the quality and accuracy of the image you already took or video you are taking. That the equipment that the drone has a gimbal for stability of the images, but even though if you have a gust of wind, it will affect the image. So it depends on the external conditions, the amount of, of light. It's very important the amount of light you have. You always have to fly it in daytime is the best time. And are certain hours in the day better due to the winds and uh, and if you are near the ocean there is a lot of of external influence that can that can affect the quality of your image but you will have a good image on time so um the, the, there was a, a question that came uh, came in that um said the uh, um are there are the image processing software solutions available? Are they proprietary or are they open source? Are there some open source options? And uh, what's the best way to learn which and how to use the image processing tools? Okay, there are open source softwares. There are open source. For example, uh, we have the we use Pix4D. Pix4D capture and you have Pix4D mapper. Okay, you have one software to plan the mission, and then you have one software to process the information. With the people of Pix4D, you can have a user and you can process in the cloud, in their cloud. You can process, but you have a limited amount of missions to process. At the end, you can, for example, have the drone and, and take the service of processing, of processing the data with the lab, for example. You can use a lab to process your information. If you want to learn how to process the data, there are programs, um, programs of, uh, for example, our lab give a training in capturing information and data collection in using the drone and also in processing the, in, in the process of the data. You have open source and then you have other platforms, for example, from the people of Esri. Uh, they have drones to map, and you can use ArcGIS, ArcGIS and QGIS also. Uh, you can have a user, but at the end you have to pay. If you have a, an alliance with them, some NGOs have a, a memorandum of agreement. Maybe they can give you a license. It depends. Of the, there, is, there is a lot of, of software you can use to process a data and information. For example, Pictera was development was... Um, working on a prototype also to use online. Uh, there are several options that you can find and they are open source. Some of them are open source. Tanya, we, we are reaching the top of the hour or we are actually over the top of the hour and we need to close down here. Um, uh, thank you very much for a, a long, a, a wide range of, of information and options uh, for this. It's uh, obviously, um, a source for much more discussion and information sharing. Uh, we will take the questions that was not answered here today and uh, we'll create a frequently asked question document and post it to 
uh, the, the Solution Center along with the recording and the slides here. So Duncan, before we close things um, down, any, any uh, questions or any, any comments from you? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Daniel. That was fantastic. Um, there's so many different applications for drones. I think it, it, it can be a little bit difficult for uh, organizations to decide where to start. So um, but I think you know, hearing this overview from you is really helpful, um, very inspiring. Um, and it, it certainly triggered quite a, a lot of ideas for me about how, how drones might be useful to NetHope and its members. So thank, thanks so much. Again, thank you very much, Dania, and thank you very much for all the great questions from the audience today. And um, uh, if you please uh, I can take a minute or so to answer the webinar satisfaction poll, that would be uh, very helpful. And uh, we want to welcome you back to uh, future webinars in, in our webinar series here. So we wish everybody a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Duncan and Dania. Thanks to you. Thanks a lot.